Tonight, the writers of Supergirl forgot that they had a tie-in to Superman Doomed, so they just submitted the event's recap page and thought no one would notice. Pandora meets up with Eye Vampire for an event that will truly make you go, oh. And Red Hood and the Outlaws just stopped trying. Just all around, all of it, just... who cares? No one's reading this anyway. All that and more tonight on the Not So New 52. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 155 of the Not So New 52. I am your host and we got a big one. Yes, we have quite possibly the biggest one. Well, okay, like second biggest, third biggest, I don't know. It's up there. It's on the podium. It might get bronze, but it's a big one. And I'm not talking about the number of comics coming out because we only have 11 comics this week. No, what I'm talking about is we are beginning quite possibly the most important series to come out of the New 52. Quite possibly the most defining thing, not just for the New 52 period, but DC Comics for the next 10 years. And that is Grant Morrison's Multiversity. Issue number one, we got it. It's here. Now, for those of you who don't know what Multiversity is, don't worry, nobody does. But you might be thinking, wait a minute, that map of the multiverse is is that what we're talking? Are we talking about the guidebook issue? No, stop that. That's six months from now. You don't jump in to something that dense that early. No, no, no. There is a plot to multiversity. There is a thing that strings the comics together, and we have to get through that before we can get to the guidebook. So. It's an important series, but not the most important issue but we will get through that in time. For now, let me just go ahead and tell you the comics that are coming out this week. Like I said, there are only 11, so including Multiversity, we also have, in no particular order, Batman and Robin, Batwoman, Red Hood and the Outlaws, Supergirl, Green Lantern New Guardians, Infinity Man and the Forever People, Teen Titans, Trinity of Sin Pandora, and our two weeklies, Batman Eternal and Future's End. The only one that's worth note out of that, well, there's a few. Pandora is its final issue. Um... I believe that's the only one that's its final issue, not counting the Future's End tie-in. But then Supergirl, I completely spaced last week. Supergirl is actually a tie-in to the Superman Doomed storyline going on. And I call it a tie-in. They label it as the next part of the story, but you'll see when we get there, it is absolutely skippable. There is nothing in Supergirl that needs to be read to understand what is going on in Superman Doomed. Doesn't that just entice you to hear about it? I'm so good at promotional things. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all I got to say up top. Um, I do have a little bit to say at the end, so be sure to stay tuned for that. But beyond that, I think it is uh, overdue. Let's go ahead and start talking about multiversity. Multiversity number one, written by Grant Morrison, art by Ivan Reyes. So, if you know Grant Morrison work, you know that this is going to be dense. And the only thing you need to read before this going in is the entirety of DC Comics. So, we open up with a zoom in of this woman's scalp as she's like trying to knock on a door and collect rent. And the narration is talking about how wherever life can find a place to go, it will be there. Life will always find a way. And we see on her scalp is what I assume are lice. And we zoom out from her thing and the narration is talking directly to the reader. Not like in an abstract way of saying like, oh yeah, you know me, I'm Batman or whatever. It's saying like, hey you, hey you reading the book, hey, whose voice do you hear in your head? Is it ours? Is it yours? What's going on? And it's very meta the whole way through. But we cut over to uh, Nick's Uotan, Uotan, I, I don't know how it's pronounced, comes from Final Crisis. It's a whole thing. He's the last of the monitors. And we see that he is dealing with a supposedly haunted comic book that is a 
issue from this series coming out in many months. Uh, it is supposedly a haunted multiversity book. And it's apparently coming out Wednesday, and he's doing research on it because if it is actually haunted, then that's going to be a problem. And it keeps on saying, like, don't read this book. Don't do it. Whatever you do, don't pick up this book. So he talks to his sidekick, uh, Captain Stubbs, who is a monkey that wears a pirate outfit. And they basically say, all right, we got to do some investigation on this. Let's go. So... He transforms into Nick Zuotan, a.k.a. the Super Judge, and he uses whatever his powers or whatever is to get on his ship called the Ultima Thule and travel through the multiverse. And he tries to figure out what is going on with this uh, book, and it takes him to Earth-7, which we see Earth-7 is completely destroyed and everyone is seemingly dead, like all the heroes around here. Now, Earth-7 is a stand-in for the Marvel Universe. More specifically, I think the Marvel Ultimate Universe back in the day. Um, so they get off the ship, they look around, they're like, this is crazy. What happened here? This is like, everything is wrong. And they see out fighting in the middle of the field, surrounded by dead heroes, is Thunderer who is a stand-in for Thor. And he's like, "What, guys, I don't know who you are, but get out of here. Run for your lives. This thing is going to kill all of us. And we see up in the sky is this giant eyeball with bat wings and fully claims responsibility saying, yes, we did this. We have the gentry. And he's like, do we have your attention now, super judge? And there's Stubbs is immediately like, we need to get out of here, man. This is messed up. But, and even Thunderbird is like, yeah, seriously, get out of here. Like, you don't stand a chance against this thing. It's our world is over. You just got to leave. And Nix is like, no, no, hold on, hold on. I, I want to see what's going on here. We got to figure this out. So Stubbs is pointing out that, uh, like the exits closing, there's no way they're going to be able to get off the planet. And he calls out to the gentry and says like, what do you want? And he's like, Oh, well, what else is there? We want you. We want to make you like us and we want you to abandon all hope. And it speaks in a very stilted way. It uses like numbers and sometimes it drops vowels, but we see, uh thunderer is trying to like build up some more energy trying to do an attack he's like look this thing destroyed our entire universe you gotta go and warn all of the other universes do whatever you can it's the end of everything and the gentry's like happy about this just like yeah no he's the last one and we're just totally gonna kill him and take away all of his hope and dignity and all that it's gonna be great uh so then he says but super judge we will let him go if you take his place and Nick's being the guy he is. He's just, yeah, of course, I'm not going to let this guy suffer. And also, I, you know, I'm more powerful. I'm a monitor. I can handle this. So he tells, tells Thunderer, hey, I got a ship over there. It'll take you to the Hall of Heroes, the multiversity. And you just got to go there and summon all the greatest heroes of like the 50 worlds. OK, go do that and I'll handle things here. And Thunderer's like, you sure, man? I don't think you can handle this. He's like, nah, I got it. Go. So as soon as Stubbs and uh, Nix are left behind, immediately things start like closing in on them. And they literally use the comic panels to show them closing in on them. So then we get introduced to other members of the gentry. I don't think they really matter, but they're called Dame Merciless, Hell Machine, Lord Broken, Demogorgon, and El Intellectron, which is the bat one. So they all come in and they start attacking Nyx and basically they just say, yeah, you think you're going to want to die here, but like we're going to keep you around indefinitely. Like this moment, this final moment is what we're going to perpetually keep going. So Nyx, Super Judge is basically just saying like, oh, we'll get out of there. We'll do it as best we can. And we see in the real world, in his universe, which I believe is Earth 33, I could be wrong. Um... No, it can't be 38. I don't know. Maybe it's zero. zero. Uh, he wakes up and we see him reaching for um, some wet. It says, choose your weapons. And he reaches for a Rubik's Cube and what seems to be a bottle of pills. So let me go to Earth-23. And Earth-23 is the race swap version that was first seen in Action Comics number nine, I believe. So we meet President Superman, Calvin Ellis. He is fighting a robot in Metropolis. He gets some intel that it's susceptible to being destroyed by just being crushed. So he flies it up in the sky, crashes it down to Earth, and 
Brainiac, his robot helper, says, hey, you got to be on Air Force One to have a meeting in like two minutes. So he flies up there, gets back into his presidential gear. And as he walks along, he's like, well, yeah, power nap, you guys. And I think I'm going to need another one soon. So we cut ahead a little bit and we see the Justice League is all meeting and they're looking at the pieces of this robotic uh, arm. And they're like, that's we don't know where this came from. It, it's nowhere on Earth. It's got a weird alloy to it. Something else is going on. And as they bring it near the cube, which has a name to it, but it was the cube that was first seen in uh, Action Comics 9. And it is the like multiversal doorway sort of thing. It starts reacting. So all of a sudden, an alarm goes off from the cube. It's an SOS. And Superman, who's standing closest to the cube, gets zapped away. And everyone's like, oh my god, he's gone. So then we cut to the House of Heroes, the Ori of Worlds, and Superman got teleported in there. And he meets up with Captain Carrot. I can't remember what Earth he's from, but regardless, Captain Carrot's like, hey, Superman, we met before, remember? I think that was Final Crisis, and that was the other Superman, to which this Superman's like, actually, no, I think there's a lot of Supermen. Uh, I don't know who you are. And he's like, ah, it's fine. I just go off the colors of your suit. Anyway, let me walk you in. And so they, he explains a bit how like all of these different people from all around the multiverse have been teleported in via their own cubes in their own universes. And nobody knows why yet. Uh, they know Thunderer was there. They introduced Spore and Dino Cop from Earth 41, which I'm like 90% sure is Image Comics. Um, and they say, yeah, we're in bleed space. We're in like a fifth dimensional thing going on here. It's it's a whole thing. But regardless, come meet the rest of the group. And we see all these different heroes have gathered around. Uh, we meet Dino Cop, who I guess is just running computers and stuff like that, trying to figure out what's going on here. Thunderer steps up and he's like, hey, everyone, I sent the alarm, but like, I I, I don't know anything else that's going on here. I'm just doing what's best I can. So uh, Superman pulls off a piece of Brainiac from his utility belt or whatever and attaches it to the computer. And up pops Harbinger from like Crisis on Infinite Earths. And she's like, hey, Jesus, I've been out for a while. What's going on? And they're just like, I don't, we don't know what's going on. We were hoping you could tell us. And she's like, okay, well, I think the, all the monitors are dead. And there's a, there's a menace going on. And you all are, must have been called as the greatest heroes of 52 worlds. And they're just like, okay, all right, sounds good. And Thunderer's like, all right, the only thing I know is we need to go save Super Judge. We need to go save Nyx. He, he gave himself for all of us. We got to go save him. So... They're already looking through other Earths, seeing who else they can get in on this. Uh, we then see the Flash from Earth 36. I don't know which one that one is. Uh, Red Racer comes up to our Superman and is like, hey, Superman, big fan of your stuff. And he holds out a copy of Action Comics and is like, I've been reading you like all this time. And we see that the way that you communicate between Earths, between universes, is through comic books. All the comic books in another universe are just stories from a different Earth. So we then get Aqua Woman from Earth 11, the gender swap universe, and she's like, I'm ready for the war party. And President Superman's like, ah, I'm thinking this is more of a fact finding thing. We shouldn't go in with war on the mind. So we that's basically our group captain carrot red racer president superman thunderbird and aquaman and they all head out to the ultima thule which apparently is made of frozen music because the difference between universes is vibrations and vibration of course translates very well to music which is just vibrations in the air we get red racer's equivalent of green lantern saying hey don't do this and he does it anyway so i don't know what that was going for uh, but they hop onto the ship, and President Superman has no idea how to fly it, but he does it by ear. And he just starts strumming on the strings, which then sends them rocketing through the bleed. There's a giant-ass monster there that they just take absolutely no interest in, and they just keep going. And eventually they try to lock on to as close as they can to Earth-7. They instead accidentally land on Earth-8, which is the other mainline Marvel Universe, Earth-616. Not actually, but close enough they call it major comics here so we open up with lord havoc who has the omni gauntlets and the genesis egg and he's like i've won i've done it all this power belongs to me thunderbird comes in he punches out the uh, his like parallel universe version of himself and he's like this isn't my world where are we 
not Iron Man steps up and is just like, all right, everyone stand down. You just punched out our version of Thor. What's going on? And immediately we see uh, their version of Captain America, their version of uh, Spider-Man, all that stuff comes up. And they're just like, oh, you just punched out our main dude. If you're working with Lord Havoc, we're going to take you down. And immediately President Superman's like, whoa, man, hey, we, we were just looking for Earth 7. I don't think we made it there, though. And apparently the ship could only take them this far. That's as far as it could get. So everyone's itching for a fight at this point. Superman's the one guy talking it down. Red Racer, who is a comic nerd, comes in and be like, uh, hey, we're in the major comics universe. That's Machine Head, American Crusader. Like, and he lists off all the different names for all the different Marvel heroes. And eventually there's Dr. David Dibble, who becomes Big Baby when he gets angry. And he transforms into a giant blue monster. He goes to punch Captain Carrot, just smashes him into the ground. Captain Carrot, however, relies off cartoon physics. So he just springs back up and then uppercuts Big Baby. And just like, ha-ha, anybody else want to take a shot with me? So at that point, President Superman intervenes saying, hey, whoa, guys, your universe is in danger. We don't want to fight. We're here to help. Cut back over to Lord Havoc, who's fighting against not Reed Richards. And he uses the uh, gauntlets to basically warp read and say oh you never stood a chance sorry his name is uh what was it frank future and he's like no the, this is it the genesis egg is hatching i will finally claim power so this egg thing cracks open as the rest of the heroes try to come in to stop him it's too late and as it cracks open we see this horrific omnipotent power has possessed lord havoc and he's like oh i saw i saw their faces so not hawkeye shoots uh Lord Havoc in, through the eyes ends up killing him. But as he goes down to the ground, his blood gets onto the egg. And they realize that this egg has something to do with Earth-7 because they feel that uh, Super Judge is inside of the egg. They see it leaking with energy. So Thunderer comes in, he zaps the egg, and it cracks open. And inside we get Super Judge, but he has been fully corrupted and we see he's, you know, fully possessed by the gentry saying that he's the judge of worlds now. And once again, the narration comes in saying, reader, what have you done? You should have put this book down now. Put it down now, which I will. Okay, here's the thing about how this book works for anyone who doesn't know. We're going to get a whole bunch of other things going on in the multiverse, some of which will deal with this plot, some of which won't. It's going to go for, like, I think nine issues. And then we get issue number two following up directly on this. Okay? Just making you aware. As for this book, I was stupid. And I read this way back when I first started collecting and barely knew anything about DC Comics at all. And let me tell you, it made zero sense now having done 150 plus episodes of this show i kind of get it i kind of understand it's still complicated and still dense but i understand it better so it's a great issue for anyone who is really into dc lore but like if you're not you need to take some lessons first you need to get some understanding here the fact i haven't read final crisis is probably my biggest stumbling block here because i there's some stuff i just straight up don't get uh, beyond that, I'm going to say this is probably a, I mean, it is solid. I, I'll give it, I'll give it a straight eight. I think it's that. I think it is a problem for new readers and that is something that should be considered. But ultimately, it's just a love letter to all of DC and it's telling a big epic story out of it. So eight for this. We will see what happens in the multiverse later on. Supergirl number 34, written by Tony Bedard, art by Carl Moline. This is technically the next part of Superman Doomed, but it isn't. So to justify that, this issue is literally just, hey, Supergirl disappeared from the book a while ago. What happened to her? And we get the follow-up on that. So we open up in Queens and we meet this boy named Michael. He's wheelchair bound and he's trying to get a hold of his parents and he's, he's freaking out because something's going wrong when all of a sudden there's a boom up on his roof and he's like, what in the hell was that? And as he goes to investigate what it was, we see that Supergirl crashed through his roof and he's like, oh geez, all right. So 
Some time passes, Supergirl starts waking up, and we see that Michael's right by her side. She is down in the sub-sub basement of this uh, building he's in, and he's like giving her water, saying, hey, you gotta hydrate. Uh, my name's Michael, and she's just like, Where, what's going on, man? What's happening? And he's like, well, the news is saying that the air is laden with like kryptonite or whatnot, so I took you down here to the sub-basement because it was originally supposed to be like a bunker. So I figured you'd be safe down here. Also, the blanket I put over you is lined with lead because, yeah, I just got one of those lying around. And she's like, well, why didn't you like take me to a hospital or something? And he's just like, I, you're Kryptonian and I don't know how people would react to that. And she's like, what do you mean? And he's like, what's the last thing you remember? And she's like, oh, well, I was part of the Red Lanterns. And then Superman was like this weird monster thing. But when he left the planet Earth, he was able to regain control of himself. And he said, uh, people back on Earth need your help now that I'm gone. And so I came back to Earth to help. And Michael continues the story saying like, yeah, here's the whole story. He beat Doomsday, but then he started fighting people and became a big monster himself. And then the U.S. military got scared and they flooded the planet with a kryptonite bomb. And therefore, the entire plant's covered in kryptonite, and it's uh, kind of affecting you as well. And I thought, maybe if I took you to a hospital, they'd think that you were going to freak out like your cousin. Well, like Superman. Doesn't say it yet. So she's like, oh, but you're not afraid of me. And he's like, nah, why would I be scared of you? You, uh, you, I was there in New York when you saved everyone from the world killers. He doesn't say it by name, but he's like, yeah, I was there. And she's like, oh. That's awesome. Someone actually saw good things I did. And he's like, not scared of me. But then she realizes, oh, wait, you're in a wheelchair. Is, like, there were casualties during our, my fight with the world. Goes, is that because of me? And he's like, no, no, no. I was in a car accident. Don't worry about it. And so, uh, yeah, Superman. Is he like your brother, your boyfriend? You know what I mean? She's like, no, no, no. He's, he's my cousin. So at that point, he's saying like, what? Are you... Or she's saying, are you scared I'm going to turn into a monster too? And he's like, oh, with a face like that, no way, wink. So he basically says, you know, after the car accident, I haven't been afraid of anything. Life is too short to be afraid. But like, I am kind of terrified right now because my parents are out in Metropolis. And there's a thing going on in Metropolis where everyone is just comatose. And I don't know where my parents are so I'm worried that they might be dead. And Supergirl's like, look, you saved my life. I'm going to go find your parents. It's the very least I can do. And he's like, you can barely stand right now. You sure you're good? And they get back up into the main street. And she's like, yeah, totally. Like, there's kryptonite in the air, but I just got to get above it. I got to get up into the clouds. And he's like, oh, is that all? So she gets up into the sunlight. She starts bathing in it. And she's like, all right, I got some power back. I can hold my breath, go down through the clouds and start taking care of business. But she's a little bit shaky. Her powers are still not at 100%, so she does what she can. As she lands, she lands next to some... Well, first off, there's a friggin' airplane that crashed into a building. There's subway, like, pile-up underneath the streets, despite the fact that all of that was explicitly said not to be happening in Superman Doom, but whatever. Uh, and Supergirl's talking to police. Police are like, whoa, hey, it's another super person. We don't want any trouble here. And he's just like, I'm here to help. I have x-ray vision. I can see people underground. I can move stuff like rubble. Just tell me where you need me. It's just like, all right, yeah, you bring them here. We'll have ambulances waiting. So she starts going around town, but like, yeah, everyone who passed out during like driving or stuff like that, most of them are already dead because there's nothing that can be done there. Uh, she uses her supervision to see that Wonder Woman's currently fighting Lois Lane Brainiac way over there, which was like, six issues ago in superman doomed but whatever and he's just like okay I'm, I'm, i've got to focus i've got to focus on trying to find people who are alive and hopefully one of them will be michael's parents that's the very least i can do so she like lifts up the airplane gets people out of the level there she goes down to the subway gets people out there and we do see michael's parents are alive saying hey we got to hold on our son's at home he needs us we got to stay alive for michael and supergirl rips open the rubble just like i'm sorry did you say michael I've been looking for you. So Supergirl flies back over to Michael's place. In the meantime, the kryptonite clouds have disappeared because that's what's been going on in the story. And she lands next to Michael saying like, hey, I've had your parents. They're safe. Everything's good. And he's like, how can I ever thank you? She's like, oh, you know, it's superheroing. It's enough. Uh, and plus, you're my friend. Like, we are friends, right? And Michael, the balls on this man, just leans in and plants one on Supergirl. And he's like, sorry. I, I maybe I shouldn't have and then she returns it saying 
oh, no, that was nice. We can uh, probably keep doing that. Meanwhile, people on the street, because they're just out on the sidewalk corner watching like, uh, yeah, this is happening. And then all of a sudden, all of their eyes, all of the humans' eyes light up and their souls start coming out of their body because that's what's going on in Superman Doomed. And Supergirl's just like, what in the hell is happening right now? It affects Michael as well. Uh, she looks up in the sky and she sees the giant Brainiac worm slug thing and just like, oh, wait a minute. I recognize that. That's Brainiac. That thing came to Krypton once. Ah, crap. This is, this is, this is awful. If it, everyone on the planet might be doomed now. But then she looks up even more. She's like, wait a minute, there's something else up there. Holy crap, that's Cyborg Superman. I ran into him before. I still don't know why he wears the House of L symbol, but you know what? If he's part of Brainiac's thing, I'm going to go up and beat him up again. That's the least I can do. So, uh, yeah, that's it. That's, that's all it was. I peeked ahead at the next issue. Well, next issue's Future's End, but I peeked ahead at issue 35. Uh... I'm hoping the fight happens in the main book because it sure as hell don't happen here. It's it's unnecessary. It's not bad. And I think it does a good job of if Michael's going to be a recurring character, which I have no idea if he is, but it does a good job of setting up this like budding romance here. A little bit faster, my takes, but you work with what you got. However, in terms of having it in the event, like... This thing covers a massive time span of saying like, oh, we were talking about the kryptonite clouds and we're talking about uh, these people who were falling unconscious and then Brainiac shows up and all their souls start going out. Like, this is a massive time span that still does not match up with what is going on in the event right now. Like, it still is behind because they dealt with the space slug. It's gone. So... Yeah, ultimately, it's it's a little bit late. It's weird that it's placed here. I don't think it works in the event, but the book itself is okay. It's not anything standout. I think overall, I'm probably going to give this one a six. It just feels very skippable, very much like if it weren't for the next issue, having a little bit of referencing back, I don't think this would be necessary at all. So six it is. Batman and Robin, number 34, written by Peter Tomasi, art by Patrick Gleason. So last issue, Batman wanted to go save Robin in Apocalypse, Damien, I should say, and Justice League wouldn't let him. So then he called in the Bat family, and that's where we left off. So this issue picks up with Batman saying, all right, look, let's deal with death of the family. All right, we didn't, we didn't deal with it before, we're dealing with it now. So he basically says, all right, everyone's pissed off because... The Joker technically knew your guys' secret identities. Maybe. Still a little bit up in the air. And you're all pissed about that. I am sorry. I will never do it again. And Batgirl, Red Robin, and Red Hood are just like, yeah, until like you do something else shady. That's constantly how this works, is that you always just hide things from us when you do stuff. And he's like, no, I promise. Nothing is held back. We tell the absolute truth from now on unconditionally. And it's it's forever. I promise you that. Got it? And they're just like, all right, maybe. All right. So he's like, look, here's the thing. I've got, I'm going to be entirely tough on you while we work together. That's still going to be a thing. But like, I need you guys to trust me for this upcoming bit. And they're like, all right, we're good. So they start listening in to what's going on. And Batman says, all right. So first thing I want to talk about here is I picked up a mother box. And they're like, what the hell's a mother box? And it's like, right, you guys aren't really part of the interdimensional justice league stuff here's a parademon and he just presses a button and a parademon the top half of one completely eviscerated just comes out of the floor and they're just like oh yeah no those things that were back at the beginning of your career yeah totally and he's like okay well yes but also like this one this one was from back then i managed to get a hold on it and it had a mother box on it but a bunch of them also just appeared in the himalayas and it's like why the himalayas and it's like well they took Damien's body and also Ra's al Ghul was there. And Red Hood's like, oh, hey, Ra's al Ghul. I fought him over in my book. And Batman's like, not now. No one's reading that book. So he, they basically say, okay. So they took their bodies to him. This, this seems wildly complicated. And he's like, it is. Let's skip ahead a bit. So we get a little bit of a time skip as he's explaining everything. And it ends up with him showing off the Hellbat armor, the super tough, big armor that he was trying to use in last issue. And they're like, okay. 
So you're sure that that armor can get you onto that planet so that you can resurrect Damien? And he's like, yeah, that's I, I genuinely think so. And everyone's like, all right, cool. Let's get in there. Let's do it. And Batman's like, whoa, no, 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 no. I'm just telling you guys my plan. None of you are a part of it. None of you are going to Apocalypse. And they're like, what? Dude, seriously? What was the point of all that? Like, the, the Justice League isn't going with you. Of course we are. And he's like, no, seriously, this is like the closest to a suicide mission I have ever done before. You all need to be here to take care of Gotham. That is why I called you here. It's it's literally the mission, all right? And they're like, guys, ser seriously, let me, let's, Bruce, come on, let us help you. And he's like, nope, I need you guys to take care of Gotham. Go out and do that. And either you'll hear from me or you'll hear from Alfred. Alfred, but like, I need you guys to stay here and continue fighting the good fight. And they're like, all right, sure. So they all hop on their little motorcycles and drive away. And then down from the ceiling comes Dick Grayson, who is, of course, dead as far as anyone else knows. And he's wearing a spiral gear and he's like, hey, man, that was a good speech. You did good. Uh, do you want me to help out? Because, like, you know, me and Damien, we're like brothers after the Grant Morrison stuff. And he's like, no, no, no. I, I want you to stay out of this as well. But if I do end up dying, you were already Batman once. Do you think you'd be okay with doing it again? And he's like, oh, absolutely. I'd totally be Batman if you want me to be. He's like, great, awesome, sounds good. Also, I need you to do a thing because of your spiral connections. Um, you can do some untraceable stuff. I need you to make distractions all over the globe all at once. And he's like, can do. So we see all of uh, the Justice League's main villains. Aquaman has Black Manta, Wonder Woman's Cheetah. Shazam has Black Adam. And Cyborg has Grid, which... It kind of feels like they wanted to get Cyborg off the map. And all of them are holograms. And they're like, okay, well, someone wanted us off the Watchtower. Someone with a whole lot of tech stuff. Who could it be? And Lex is up there and he's thinking about it. He's like, okay, well, the teleporters are down as well. So clearly it's somebody who knows our tech. And immediately he's like, ah, crap. And runs back to where Batman keeps his Hellbat armor. And he's like, I am insulted that you would put all of the distractions for the other members, except for me and Captain Cold, to which Batman already in the armor is just standing behind him being like, don't try to stop me, man. He's like, I'm not going to try to stop Dude, you do it. You go for it. I'm going to help you out, in fact. And he's like, you're just stalling until the flying members of the league can get up here. And he's like, no, seriously, I 100% I understand what you're doing here. Um, I'm going to run a little bit of tech stuff to get you more strength. And also I'm going to take this tracker that Cyborg put on you and just take that off. And he's like, what's your game, Luther? I'm not quite following here. He's just like, oh, it's, it's, we're both mortal men here playing amongst gods. I fully understand what you're doing right now. Um, and he says, "Do you, you are aware, though, that the suit poses a massive danger to you, right? And he's like, eh, I'll, I'll work out the bugs on the fly. And he's like, yeah, all right. So apparently it's something to do with an energy interchange and like it can drain his own metabolism so he says uh you know he's got to go now wonder woman and shazam are flying in he's just like yeah totally no problem and luther calls him out saying like it was your son wasn't it damien was your son and he's just like yeah but he wasn't like taken he was murdered and i want you to be clear on that i'm going to get him back so he uses the mother box opens up a boom tube just as wonder woman and uh shazam arrive they're too late. They can't stop them. And we see Batman appear on Apocalypse. And that's the issue. I like it. I think it's a solid opening here. It's it's very fast paced. I do feel like it's a little bit weird. Like, I don't know. It's not a bait and switch, but it's like strange to me that last issue they took the time to say, all right, the Bat family's going to be helping out. And then this issue they get halfway through and say, no, gee, you thought the Bat family was? Dude. No, never. Why would they? They're normal people on Apocalypse. That's insanity. Which I I get the direction and I understand why they did it. It just makes last issue's cliffhanger feel a little bit stupid. Um, but no, I mean, the rest of this issue was fine. I like the conversation he has with Lex. I like how Lex is like, nah, man, I'll help you out. No problem. And it kind of feels a little bit like with Batman gone, I have one less thing to worry about on the Justice League, but also, like, he does genuinely understand. So, it's a nice look for him. And the Hellbat armor looks fantastic as well. So, no matter what's going on with this, I'm pumped for it. I think it's going to lead to a good arc on Apocalypse, however long that's going to last, and I'm looking forward to it. So, I'm going to give this one... I'm going to give this a 7.5. Very good, not quite great, but still definitely worth checking out.
Bad Woman number 34, written by Mark Andrego, art by Jeremy Hahn and Moritat. So last issue, Kill Shot took a shot at Nocturna, ended up missing, and now it's a four-way fight, well, three-way fight, where Bad Woman is there, Kill Shot is there, and then Nocturna and her stepson slash lover, uh, Night Thief, are there. So they're all fighting out. Bad Woman's like... I, I don't know if I should trust Killshot right now or if I should trust Nocturno. Who am I more focused on trying to get right now? So first thing that happens is Night Thief charges after Batwoman. She dodges out of the way and attacks Killshot. So at this point, it's Night Thief versus Killshot. He's just like, well, all right, guess I'll get one up on you because I've got cybernetic enhancements that allow me to take a lot more hits than you can deal out. So then Batwoman comes in, starts attacking him as well. And as they are start their little bout, Night Thief goes over to Nocturna being like, hey, we should get out of here, man. To which Nocturna is watching Batwoman like, oh my God, she's so hot. So as Killshot's fight like, goes down to uh, elbow from Batwoman, she goes over to Nocturna and Night Thief and is like, all right, you guys stay here. I'm, I'm not done with you. Something happened down at the museum. Uh, to which Killshot then manages to tackle Batwoman and rips off her mask to which point uh it becomes kill shot versus night thief again but immediately Batwoman's like crap man i i gotta get back to my mask i i literally have my identity out in the open here and as they're fighting she manages to get back to it but not before nocturna manages to see kate's secret identity and says oh you look beautiful you're even lovelier without the mask to which Batwoman then just kicks her in the head so kill shot gets his gun says all right i'm done with this now i'm gonna take out the girl to do my job so he pulls the trigger night thief dodges in the way takes the bullets instead of nocturna to which she's like anton no my lover slash steps on and he goes falling off the building nocturna dives after him and he's like oh i'm so sorry i failed you and they both plummet into the water down below and kill shot's like all right, guess I'm done here. Thanks for the assist. I'll uh, give you part of the check. So he goes to leave. Batwoman gets up and hits, wraps a rope around him that's electrified. To which point the police arrive and Batwoman's like, he's all yours. I'm out and just leaves. So back at Maggie's apartment, if you remember last issue, Kate made a deal with Maggie's ex-husband about the custody thing and not dragging it out and letting her keep the kid and it turns out that this is what it was we see that kate is packing up all of her stuff moving it out of the apartment and as she's looking at some photos she leaves behind her key and a letter and she's like all right let's get out of here before maggie shows so she goes to the elevator and of course just as she gets on it wouldn't you know maggie's the one coming off of it and she's like ah damn it all right i thought i could uh, hey, Maggie, how's it going? And she's just like, oh, hey, it's fantastic. Wouldn't you know, my ex-husband called. He's dropping all of his suits and stuff. We're, I'm going to be able to keep custody. Like, everything's great. I want to go out to dinner with you. Let's go. And she's like, um, I'm not feeling up to it tonight. So sorry. I, I just got to go home. I'll, uh, I'll talk to you later, okay? And she's like, oh, yeah, of course. Maybe we can get breakfast tomorrow. She's like, maybe. Bye. So she walks off. Maggie enters the apartment and reads the letter. And the letter's given in its entirety to the readers. It's basically just saying, like, look, I was a thing that was in the way of you and your child. And I lost my mother when I was a kid. I don't want your kid going through the same thing with her mother. I don't want your kid wondering, you know, what it would be like to have her mom mourn her life. Because that's something that I wonder about every day. I have been to therapy. I know this is the healthy choice. This is what needs to happen. And I'm not going to let you choose for me because I know that you love me and you you are going to want me to stay. But ultimately, this is what's best for everyone. So she says, that, you know, I'll, I'll be here when, you know, maybe once she grows up, maybe then we can be together. But for right now, be a mom to your kid. For now, I love you. Goodbye. And we see... Kate is back talking to her therapist, and her therapist is like, okay, how do you how do you feel about that? And she's like, I feel crappy. Everything about that feels crappy, but like it had to be done. And he's just like, all right, well, you know, don't don't short sell yourself. You did a good thing for her. You did what was best. And she's like, Yeah, yeah, totally. But the therapist asked, Well, why did you make up the story though? Why didn't you mention the thing about the ex-husband, the deal you made with him of you leave her life and he'll back off? And she's like, 
if I do that, then Maggie will end up fighting with him again, and then she he's just going to sue. Like it's, just, it's not going to fix anything. This is me taking the blame, and falling on that sword is the only thing that's going to keep their little life altogether fine. And she looks sad about it, but ultimately she's accepting. So later on that night, we see Nocturnus just roaming the streets. She passes by a newsstand, and wouldn't you know it, Kate Kane is on the front cover of a tabloid gossip magazine. And immediately Nocturne is like, oh, that's where I've seen you before. You're Batwoman. Okay. And there's this guy who's running the newsstand being like, hey, ladies, this ain't a library. To which point she casts a little spell thing on him. And he's just like, please take all of my books. Have them. They're yours. So we then cut to Kate, who is watching the news at home, just sipping on wine. Eventually, it starts talking about, you know, Maggie has being the... uh detective on a case she has a statement on tv and she's like all right well enough of that i'm going to bed so she gets in bed and in her drunken sleepy state she hears someone behind her and she's like what maggie is that you and she's like seeing maggie through her de delirium but it turns out it's actually nocturna and nocturna's like oh it isn't the wine and it, i'm not maggie and then nocturna bites her neck and I guess Batwoman's a vampire now. Yep. Um, okay. On a purely textual level, I'm okay with it. I think it's a fine enough, you know, they set up the reasoning as to why they had to break up. It was for the kid. They made it at least positive enough of a character change and character growth. As much as it sucks, I get it. On the metatextual level of why they had to break up to begin with boo you dc you suck don't don't do that to your characters i'm, I'm just frustrated with the editorial decision there that's nothing to say about the writer itself so overall it's fine it does feel like the first eight pages because i think those were also the pages that were done by moritat uh instead of jeremy Hahn. They stand out as completely separate from the rest of the book. Like, they just kind of felt like they had to wrap up that bit and then, okay, now we're on to this other stuff. So, it does feel a little bit disjointed, but it's not a bad issue overall. And it does feel like it's setting up more future stuff, so we'll see what we get out of that. Overall, I think this is probably going to be a... Uh, I'll give it a 7, but it's like just barely cracking that. It, it seems more like a 6.5, but ultimately I think the emotion out of the letter and the way that they do the scene, it really works for me. So I'll give it the 7, but watch yourself. Red Hood and the Outlaws, number 34, written by Scott Lobdell, art by R.B. Silva and Corey Smith. Last issue, jeez, oh, okay, so Starfire went off to find someone, there's like aliens that gather at Abu Dhabi, and they're all like slavers and stuff, and Starfire went off to go pick a fight with one of them, and when you know it's the super strong one that showed up and like started attacking her. Also, something's going on at Shade. And that's where Red Hood and Arsenal are. So we pick back up in Abu Dhabi. And the big monster is attacking uh, Starfire. To which she just immediately turns around, decks him. And he's like out. He's automatically out of the game. Uh, his name is Trevoral. And he's just like, oh, I don't know why you searched for me, Starfire. And he's just like, I don't care about you at all. Like, I'm not here for you. But I'm here for your former master your overlord the guy that you worked for tell me where he is and he's just like you know if i do that he'll kill me i'm as good as dead and she's like all right well i'll give you some motivation and we see her fly up into the air carrying trevoral and says if you tell me i'll put you out of your misery otherwise i'm going to keep you alive for weeks and he just cries out saying oh here's his exact address so we go back to shade the ant farm and there's a they they apparently are being chastised by Red Hood and Arsenal for thinking that Starfire would have anything to do with slavery, considering her backstory. And it's like, surely, if you've been monitoring us for that long, you know that she was in slavery. She would never participate in the slave trade, to which point they just say, OK, fair enough. Let's find her. And so the guy on the computer is having a hard time doing it. Uh, Arsenal steps in, presses a few buttons, and then they've got a ping that she's in Malibu. So 
they say, all right, we're going to go down and do that. And it's like, whoa, no, you're not. This is a shade thing. We got to send in our, our trained guys. And he's just like, no, she's part of our team. She's got her own stuff going on. And you guys are going to freak her out. We're going to go down there. And it's like, all right, fine. You got an hour. And then we send in our guys. Okay. So then we go to, and it shows specifically like a cliff facing, like, ranch house like it's over the edge of a cliff it's stormy there's a baby crying in a crib and the grandfather comes in picks up the baby to which the grandfather then looks out the window and in a lightning strike starfire standing there with glowing eyes he's like all right sets the baby back down in the crib goes out to the front door and lets starfire in and just like well this is my home this is where my wife and granddaughter live if you want to talk to me about something we can be civilized about it do you want to drink and starfire just shatters the bottle being like i'm not here to drink i'm not here to meet your family i'm here to kill you because you are the guy who enslaved me you were a guy who enslaved thousands of people out in space and i remember uh they said that you had a heart of stone with how cruel you are but the first time i interacted with you i knew you didn't even have a heart you are truly an absolute monster and the grandfather's like look I've led a good life. If this is my past catching up to me, so be it. Let me give you a little bit of exposition as to how we got here. Uh, you had that uprising. You took over the planet and whatnot. During the chaos, I escaped here to Earth. I crash landed. I was not in good shape. A woman stopped, found me, picked me up. I was going to kill her, but then I just couldn't bring myself. She was so kind, so beautiful. I let her live. I got an Earth job. I uh, We adopted a child, and then, wouldn't you know it, they had a grandchild and the moment i saw that grandchild i just all the evil left my heart i was truly good and whether you believe me or not just know i am so very sorry for everything i did and she's like doesn't matter to me i still am going to kill you he's like all right well can we at least go outside this is my family's home so they go outside again very remote location in the middle of a storm against an ocean on a cliff face and she leads him out into this open field, gets him down on his knees, and is about to pull the trigger with an energy star bass. When, on top of rooftops in the city that I guess is right behind them, despite the fact that that was not there at all, wouldn't you know it, Red Hood and Arsenal showed up. And they say, Corey, you gotta stop, don't do this. And now they're in the middle of a courtyard of this other entirely separate building. And it's just like the artists just, 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 just forget. They just have no idea where they are right now. Maybe we changed artists halfway between here. I don't know. Regardless, this is sloppy. This is awful. So Starfire is like, you don't know what he did. You don't know what he put me through. And both Red and Arsenal are like, but you've grown so much out of that. You don't. He may have ruined your life before, but there's no reason to give him uh, the pleasure of ruining it anymore. Don't do this, Starfire. And she gets angry she takes off into the sky and she just leaves and they all look at the slaver guy and just be like okay look you're still definitely an evil dude we're gonna put you in space jail uh we just gotta find out someone who knows about the evil stuff you did and he's like oh you don't understand your friend was right and he grabs arsenal's bow and jams it into his neck turns out it was an exploding arrow and his head explodes and he's just like oh geez all right well I guess that's okay then. So then we go to the Avery Coast, which is where Starfire's ship is docked. And she goes in, she presses her hand to a safe that's biometrically locked, and inside is some orange liquid. She says nothing, she just looks at it. And then all of a sudden, we see Starfire on the coast of, I guess, the beach wearing uh, just like a white dress. Like a sundress, and then like there's no text. It just I looked at the original comic as it came out, not the trade version, and it just says tune in next month for futures end tie-in. Like it doesn't explain what the hell just happened. I have no idea what's happening here. This issue was garbage. This issue is absolute. Okay, let's let's ignore the art problem of all of a sudden they're just in the middle of a city center, which frankly I can't ignore. That is way too big of a thing. But like. What is even being said here? Yes, okay, we have an emotional moment where Starfire is confronting her ex-slave or whatever, and it's like this whole big thing. Fine, all right, you want to have that moment? Sure. What did we accomplish in this issue? That that she just didn't kill him, but like she really, really wanted to and is pissed off that she didn't? Also, what's the last two pages? Why did Starfire open this safe? 
What's the liquid? Why did she all of a sudden just appear in on a beach in a totally different costume? None of this makes sense. This issue is just absolute trash. And I cannot even begin to say, oh yeah, you know, at least this thing has something. No, like it's all garbage. It's all bad. So yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say this one is, uh, this one's a 1.5. I didn't have a good time. I, I straight, like, this is the end of the arc as well. Like the trade ends here. Was it sad? No, it wasn't satisfying at all. It just stopped, which frankly, I wish it would have done, I don't know, 33 issues ago, but we had to go through what we got and now they're going to keep going. So, oh God, this is just a wreck. 1.5 and they're lucky they're getting that much out of me. Green Lantern New Guardians number 34, written by Justin Jordan, art by Brad Walker and Rodney Buscemi. So last issue, we got Space Zoo Experiment, whatever you want to call it. And we met up with the head of the experiment, who's a giant lizard thing that apparently was made the way it was because of the Guardians. So we see all of the captured Guardians are talking to each other telepathically, psionically. Apparently it's through the system itself. And they're all like, one of them is uh, calling out. I think it's the main one that they were looking for. And they're just like, oh, geez, man, we thought you were dead. And he's like, nah, not quite. Pretty close. But regardless, I, I'm, I'm going to be able to get a distraction going because I am embedded in the system. I need you all to be ready. We may not be able to use our powers now, but you will be able to. So just be ready for the queue. Uh, meanwhile, Kyle and Carol are using their constructs to make kaiju and just start attacking the uh, big lizard guy who's in charge of it, which, by the way, they call Scions. I don't know if that's the race or the guy or whatever, but that's the name of the villain, Scion. So as the kaiju are attacking, uh, it gets absorbed into... It's like little central thing it's got going on. And they very specifically show that inside of this guy's cavity is... A mother box and it's going ping 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 every time that it does like anything so the guy's like oh look hard light technology you guys know about the creators you guys are all about them so i would like to further study your stuff and they're like yeah okay we're just gonna beat you up now so they keep on trying to attack meanwhile we see that the moment has finally come for the guardians to break out their systems are down long enough that they're able to launch an offensive and they all start breaking out one by one from their cells and they're like all right we made it out let's go find our brother so honestly there's not a lot for me to say on kyle and carol's plot because it is essentially just we keep fighting the big lizard guy over and over again but we cut over to carol who is being telepathically contacted by uh quaros the one who was you know cut up a little bit a little bit messed up last issue and he's like hey I'm embedded in this system. Um, I can't help you directly, but I can do like indirect things. For instance, I've just lowered down the security on the archive area. And before we can explain anything else, Carol's like, I know what that means. And she goes and she blasts all of the cells for the experiments and lets them all free. And they all start attacking the big lizard guy. And Carol's like, hell yeah, this is exactly what I wanted. So Kyle's still fighting another one of them because I guess there are two of them. And he's basically just saying like, look, Kyle, dude, I don't want to fight you. I don't, I don't, I don't care about that. Like you have the ability to make a perfect universe and the drive to do so. Like, I just want to understand you because if I can understand you, then I can control you. And he's like, yeah, I'm not really big on that and I'm not going to let you do it. So as uh, he's continuing to fight and we see Kyle basically just stops attacking and he, the guy's like, what, what are you doing? You, you've ceased fighting, but like you haven't given up, have you? And he's like, nope. So then all of a sudden the guardians come in, they blast the guy. Turns out Kyle was just waiting for them to do their thing. And the blizzard dude is just like, I don't understand. I was just trying to further your goal. I figured this is what you wanted. And all the Guardians are like, hey, we followed Koros to this area. Where is he? And Kyle's like, ah, you don't. You don't want to deal with that, man. Don't go near that. And they all end up finding Koros. And he is obviously not in a good place, but he is still conscious. And he's speaking to them telepathically, basically saying like, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm stuck here. There's no way you're going to be able to disassemble 
me from this machine and get me back. And they're just like, no, 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 we can find a way, we can find a way. He's like, nah, this is it for me. Look, I'm going to let you guys escape. And um, we can't let them escape at all. Like, they are too dangerous with their own stuff going on, their belief systems. Maybe it is our fault that they ended up the way they did. Not us, like, individually, but, like, as a race of guardians. But ultimately... Hopefully the good that we can do moving forward can outweigh the bad of our past. That's all I can hope for here. And everyone's telling Quarles like, we can get you out of here. Please give us a chance. And he's like, no. Also, all of the other experiments, they're equally as screwed. Like, they're all going to die here as well. So, uh... Koros basically funnels all of the Guardians, along with Kyle and Carol, into a single area. They're being converged here so that Koros can make his last stand. And he wraps them all up into a green energy bubble and just blasts them away from the ship. And he says, like, guys, don't worry about it. Just make sure you go out and you do good things. That's all I'm asking for you. Make that not in vain. And so he interacts with the ship and uses the mother box that's embedded in some capacity to essentially explode the entirety of the ship up. And everyone watches on. They're crying. They're sad and whatnot. And Carol's like, I... I are you okay, Kyle? And he's just like, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't know if they're going to be all right. And I'm feeling their feelings. And it's just messed up that any of this happened at all. And they're looking out at the remnants of the ship. And we zoom in on it and see that a the mother box survived. And it's going ping, ping, ping. Because wouldn't you know, we got an event coming up that involves mother boxes. All right. I really like this arc. In the previous two issues is a three issue arc. I think the last two issues were really good because they set this sense of dread and horror of just like body horror. Like it's disturbing the things that this alien was doing to other creatures. This issue gave us the full reveal as to what they are. I mean, technically that was last issue, but like, you know, all the mystique's gone. We show that the guardians are able to break themselves out. Nothing really new is introduced here except for the mother box being around. I don't know. I just feel like it didn't end as strongly. That's the wrong word. Because, you know, a big sacrifice is still a big, strong ending. I'm not opposed to that. It just didn't feel like it meshed with what we were seeing already. It felt like it was its own separate thing that was just kind of interjected here. It's not to say I didn't like the arc as a whole, I still think that it performs strongly enough. This ending's just kind of not what I was looking for, if that makes any sense. Um, beyond that, I think I'm probably going to give this one... I'll give it a 7. I, I think it's competent enough to get that 7 mark. It's not great by any means, but it is still a very solid issue overall. And the arc, I mean, the first two issues more than make up for it. So definitely check that out if you're interested. Infinity Man and the Forever People, number three, written by Dan DiDio and Keith Giffen, art by Jim Starlin. So, last issue, the group all join forces and summon Captain Planet. I mean, Infinity Man. And the issue just ended there. This issue, something happened in the in-between, and we pick up with the group all unconscious on the floor, a wall full of TV monitors exploded, and they're surrounded by crates of lettuce. So... They start coming to one by one. They're feeling like, ah, Jesus, does anyone remember what just happened? Everything's all blurry. And they remember, oh, that's right, the mother box was calling to us. Let's assess the mother box what happened. And Viking reaches for it, and it's completely inert. It's not responding. And then all of a sudden, they look over at the wall of monitors, and they're like, well, what happened here? What's going on? And the glass from the monitors, which is all over the ground, then comes back up reforms the monitors. And then on each of them is Infinity Man. And he says, hello, I'm Infinity Man. Uh, look, here's my whole thing. The universe needs a little bit of chaos. And New Genesis is all about order. I'm not saying that we need to throw it to dark side or anything like that, but there needs to be a balance between the two. And, um, you guys got to stop New Genesis from taking over everything. And Viking's just like, but Hi Father's a good guy. He's, he's He cares about all the new gods. And Infinity Man's like, even if a tyrant is benevolent, he's still a tyrant. Seriously, I am Infinity Man. Anyway, you guys were fighting Mantis. I just kind of stopped him for a while, but um, now I'm going to set him free. 
Your first task is to heal him. Show me your worth, not by fighting, but by healing him. And then all of a sudden, Mantis just explodes out of the monitors going like, I don't know where I am, but I swear to God, I'm going to beat somebody up. So as he gets out, everyone's like, okay, hold on, hold on. Infinity Man said, let's talk to him. Mantis, we want to help you. Mantis is like, what? Screw you guys. I'm going to beat you up. I mean, you, you guys are food to me. So Viking's like, well, we tried. Throws a punch at him. Mantis immediately just knocks him back on his ass. Uh, he looks over at Dreamer, who is currently poking around inside of his brain, and he's just like, I can feel you in there. Well, what are you doing? And he's just like, oh, well, you know, I'm not alone in there. So then Serafina jumps in, does her light blast. She gets knocked out. Uh, Mark Moonrider also knocked out. And so he goes after Dreamer again, and Dreamer's like, please, stop. He wants to come out, but I won't let him. And Mantis is like, what? what in the hell are you talking about, man? And that's when Bear comes in, throws a punch, and tries taking out Mantis. So they get into a little bit of a fight, and he's just like, oh, you're from not from Apocalypse, are you? And he's just like, no, I came here from Earth. This is all your fault. He, your stuff is what transformed me. He's like, what? We came in peace. That couldn't be the case. And he's just like, yeah, you came here to evolve the human race. Look at what you did. I turned into a bug thing. And turns out that this guy is Bashir, which is Bear's contact at this farm. And he's been transformed and turned evil and whatnot. And Bear is so hurt by this. He's like, you were my friend. We built this all together. And so Bear tackles him, grabs hold of him, and just starts like squeezing. He's like, you're, you're nothing but a mistake. You, you need to be corrected. And Manson's just like, oh, your failure is me and you must live with that. So Bear turns around to Moonrider, says, hey, go ahead, do a big zap at him, you know, hit him. And he's like, uh, I might zap you, man. You sure? And he's like, nah, do it. Keep on hitting him. Don't let up. So he once again blasts him like as many times as he can. He basically sets Mantis on fire, and Mantis eventually squirms his way out and flies out of the building and just leaves. He just bails. And Mark Moonrider's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I did what you said. And Bear's like, don't worry about it. I just, I need a minute to breathe. So... At this point, Dreamer collapses, and everyone's like, oh god, what's up with her now? So, we cut inside of her mind. I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure what's going on, but she talks to this entity that apparently she is familiar with, but she's never actually directly spoken to, and she, the entity is just like, hey, you're not afraid of me, are you? And just like, no. And it's like, cool, great, because I'm a giant floating skull inside your brain. And I, I, I figure, you know, they're just jealous of me, all the other people I've talked to. So... Dreamer says, I was hoping we would never have to talk, we'd never have to meet, but, you know, it, it's inevitable, it's something, and the my head's like, yep, that's exactly true. So anyway, uh, let's go, I've got stuff to show you. Don't worry about Mantis, he, like, genuinely doesn't even matter. So, they go through a portal in her mind, and she's like, where are you taking me? And just like, oh, it's your mind, I'm just taking you to all the places that you, uh, have been and plan to go to. So, we see that this thing might very well be the anti-life equation, or at least some aspect of anti-life, because it's saying the anti-life is a powerful thing, and because of your connection, uh, you are currently sought after by a bunch of gods and idealists and stuff, and they're all going to be coming after your power. So you, we need each other because you need me to help defend you. So then they go and they show a weird ritual or something with a guy named, what's his name? Lord Agog. I don't know what's going on there. It's very weird. We see that Infinity Man is here watching the ritual as this giant dude just stands over. We also have Kyle Rayner, Darkseid, Highfather, and I think his name is Hymon are all watching this as well. So anyway, all of the thing just zaps away, and the skull's like, well, what will it be, Dreamer? Will you uh, let someone rule you, or will you rule with the anti-life? Because all that is waiting is betrayal and death. And then Dreamer comes to, and she's like, oh, Jesus, where's Mark? Where's my boyfriend? Jesus Christ. So she says, yeah, I get some dreams sometimes. We need to work things out. I'm, I'm just trying to figure it all out. And she doesn't explain anything else. So... Viking's like, so what do you make of all this? What do we do, Big Bear? And he's just like, I have no idea. Just keep an eye on her. Cut to New Genesis. Student, like an intern, walks into Headmaster Hyman's 
office and he's like hey i was keeping track of the earth people and everything was just going fine it was a little bit weird but then all of a sudden there was a huge spark of energy and look infinity man's on this hologram and Hyman's like oh my god have you told anybody else and he's like no not at all but we should definitely tell high father right and he's like we could or you could delete it forget you ever saw it and i'll do some more investigations on my end but we definitely don't mention this to high father okay cool, cool great awesome okay get out of my office bye and he just like slams the door on him so it turns out that Viking's girlfriend was in the office, heard all of this happening, and she's like, oh, I don't understand why you let them go to Earth in the first place when this was a possibility. And he's like, well, I gave them a malfunctioning mother box, but because of your stupid boyfriend, it ended up working. So, yeah, it kind of blew it. Anyway, you got to go to Earth and you got to take care of this, okay? So we cut back with our group on Earth. Uh, Viking is activating the mother box again, trying to get a boom tube so they can not teleport back to new genesis but just on earth and as they activate the boom tube something's going wrong there's some weird readings and then all of a sudden it's too late to cut the power the entirety of the farmhouse explodes and that's it that's what happens it's okay i mean it's it's i don't have a lot to say on it i think that it's still it's weird that it's setting up so much lore still with like dreamer and whatnot i don't think you know, it's a particularly bad time for it, but I know this series doesn't last long. I know that Dan DiDio and Keith Giffen don't know that, but I know this series doesn't last long. So I automatically, like, them setting up all these big things of, like, Dreamer has something with the Ancy life and there's this secret plot amongst New Genesis of, like, capturing Infinity Man or maybe something like that. Whatever it may be, it feels like a lot of plot set up when we're already a third of the way through this series. So... I'm okay with this issue inherently, but looking at it on a macro scale, I just feel like this is going to end in disappointment. So I'm going to give this one a, I'm going to give it like a 6.5. It's all right. It's not great. It's definitely weird that Infinity Man shows up, says, hey, try to heal this guy. And then immediately everyone's like, now nah, we're going to beat him up some more. So yeah, it's a, it's a 6.5 for me. Teen Titans number two, written by Will Pfeiffer, art by Kenneth Rockefort. So last issue, there was a whole big terrorist attack thing on Star Labs. No one knows what happened, but it ended with Bunker tearing a guy apart, not literally, but verbally. And it ended with him saying, like, and don't forget, under these masks, we're dangerous. This issue picks up, just recapping everything that happened, and we see people watching the video of Bunker saying, hey, underneath our masks, we're dangerous. And we see Bunker himself is re-watching this video over and over again. And he lives with Beast Boy, who at this point is a little green elephant just walking around the apartment. And he's like, dude, stop watching that. Check this out on the TV. And he turns on the DC Universe's equivalent of Grumpy Cat called Krabby Cat. And everyone loves Krabby Cat. And Bunker's like, dude, seriously, I have every right to be serious. This is something that matters. And he's like, look, I get it, but you taught the guy a lesson. You wrecked him up good. And like, don't, there's no need to get hung up over it. And Bunker uses his powers and says like, no, there is like thousands, maybe millions of guys like that. We got to change things. And he takes a little itty bitty psychic brick and puts it into Beast Boy's ear and Beast Boy transforms back. He's like, Jesus, man, that's like war crime level. Don't do that. So, Back at a uh, hospital building of a jail complex, we meet one of the terrorists, the one that Wonder Girl threw into a wall. Turns out he was supposed to be a suicide bomber, and it didn't explode, but he broke nearly every bone in his body. So the doctors are like, he's a very lucky boy. And they leave the room. Turns out Red Robin was in there already interrogating him when they entered. He's like, now, where were we? What do you know? Tell me about your leader. Give me all the info you have. And the terrorist is like, I don't know nothing, man. I swear to God. I, it was all secret hush-hush stuff. We didn't know more than we had to. I don't know anything. And in fact, I'll prove it. And he says, our job, the bus thing, it, it wasn't a one-time thing. I heard other guys saying that they were working like multiple contacts. Like they were going to be coming back for something bigger. And if I had to guess, next job's coming up at, and then all of a sudden his heart monitor goes flat and he just starts seizing up. Doctors run back in and say, oh, my God, but like his morphine drip accidentally got turned on to like full blast and he was flooded in seconds. This it's new tech from Star Labs. This shouldn't be glitching out this badly. Oh, well. 
So then we meet up with a woman named Teresa Cicero, who is locking up at her job. She's walking home, calling her mom, saying, hey, I know it's a dangerous block, but don't worry about it. I'm only one block away from home. I'll be fine. And as she's walking down, she then immediately gets jumped by a bunch of guys saying like, oh, yeah, one block's a lot longer than it looks. But before they can do anything, a gang of women all dressed like wonder girl to varying degrees holding like baseball bats and pipes and chains they say you want to talk to her you talk to us first and they just beat the ever-loving crap out of these guys and then hand Teresa a baseball bat and says hey you want to be part of something bigger than yourself and she gives a little smile so sure that'll be coming back uh we then go to star labs where Manchester Black and Josiah Power are saying, hey, whoever broke into our system here, like they like they were able to shove their hand through a guy's face with zero force. It must be like ridiculously sharp. We need that level of technology on our side. It'd be great. But also like it's got we need we see that the people at Star Labs, the higher ups are thinking that they don't need to relocate to this new secure facility they need to be convinced a little bit more. There needs to be something more going on. When all of a sudden, in the city, the main Star Labs place just explodes. It catches on fire on the top floors. So cut back to Bunker and Beast Boy. Bunker shows Beast Boy a live feed saying, hey, Star Labs is exploding. Also, there's this thing about Wonder Girl going on. Just keep that in mind. But like, Star Labs is exploding. We can be there in a minute. Let's go. So they go down there. And one of the scientists come out. Uh, and basically says, hey, the fire's up on like the 14th floor and we've got a bunch of really high tech stuff up on the 15th floor that if it catches fire will destroy all of Manhattan. So Beast Boy is in charge of getting out the scientists. Bunker's going to take care of the fire. So he busts in and as he gets in there, we meet back up with the terrorist lady from the last issue and he's just like, hey, you're the boy who stopped the bus. I'm gonna kill you. And Bunker's like, oh, uh, Beast Boy, we got a situation. She's like, ah, ah, ah. I have uh, jammed your comms. There's nothing you can do. And now I'm going to uh, take you out. And Bunker just doesn't waste any time, just throws a whole port of bricks at her and just like, ah, well, I've got a few surprises myself. But it doesn't do anything to stop her. She gets up. She manages to get a hold of Bunker. But because of him throwing bricks, he managed to uncover her face and it's revealed that she is a robot. And Bunker says, oh, you're a robot? That changes everything. And so he just psionically makes a bunch of bricks appear inside of her skull. And she, her head explodes. So Beast Boy is getting all the scientists to safety. Bunker uh, activates the fire suppression thing on the 15th floor. But it's not actually that because that was disabled by the robot lady. Uh, turns out this is a bunch of itty bitty microscopic psychic cubes so bunker's getting more and more control of his power that he's able to do that and as bunker comes down beast boy who's in chimp form right now is like and remember everybody the person who saved the day is bunker the hero of new york again so we then cut to the new york port authority where a news broadcast is just saying all that stuff going on and then they start talking about the wonder girl gang and at this point a woman is walking by and she sees the thing saying, oh, Cassie, oh, my baby girl, what have you gotten yourself into? I guess this might be Cassie's mom. I don't know. I don't remember what she looked like from the last run. So sure. And we then cut over to the Lower East Side where there is a concert going on called Dark Mistress, where it is a tribute band to Raven of the Teen Titans. And wouldn't you know it, Raven shows up there in her normal civilian looking outfit. She walks in and everyone's talking about Raven. They're all just like, oh yeah, she scares me, but like in a good way. So all of a sudden Dark Mistress starts playing and Raven seemingly enjoys herself. She starts smiling and having fun. Uh, then we cut final page to somewhere else. The robot lady reassembles herself as someone's talking to her, saying like, yeah, 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 okay, your head blew up, get over it. Your name is Algorithm. You know you can fix yourself up as good as new. Here's what I need you to do. You need to cause more chaos at everything involving Star Labs so that they will be convinced to move their facility elsewhere. That's the only way our plan is going to work. And right now there's a bunch of Star Labs interns at this concert for Dark Mistress. You go there, you cause some chaos just blow the whole thing up 
it'll it'll work perfectly for our plans and wouldn't you know it the person who's saying all this stuff is manchester black because of course it is so yeah and then manchester black says something about plus if you're lucky you might run into an old friend so it implies that this woman may be related to the teen titans to some extent i don't know i don't care it's here's the thing this wasn't a bad issue it wasn't a bad issue at all i actually think it flowed very nicely every single time that there was like a transition to a different plot they did this thing where there was a visual lead into it and it made it flow very nicely it didn't feel like anything was too jarring but overall it's just not grabbing me yet it doesn't feel like i really have a grasp on what's going on and sure you can play the mystery angle i'm fine with that i'm not saying you can't have that but it just doesn't feel like it's trying to play the mystery angle it just feels like it hasn't told me what it's focusing on is this bunker being the hero like last issue when it ended i thought for sure that his thing of saying like under these masks were dangerous was going to be a cause for alarm where people were going to start fearing the teen titans no nope. They all love him, and I, I don't understand what the point of it was. So I it's just a little unclear what the mission statement of this arc is yet. Hopefully we'll get around to it, but Teen Titans has burned me so frequently, even if it isn't Will Fiverr's fault, I'm just a little bit hesitant. So I'm going to give this one probably... I'll give it a 7, but half a point for that is strictly Kenneth Rockefeller doing pretty good art. So take it out for what you will. Trinity of Sin, Pandora, number 14, written by Ray Fox, art by Tom Derenick and Francis Portella. Last issue, we had Agent Kincaid coming up to Giganta and Pandora and say, look, help me out with this vampire thing going on downtown and uh, we'll be clear. In this issue, they do that. So we open in Baltimore and we see a bunch of buildings have been boarded up and all that. And it's implied that it might be because of aquaman during the 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 just of the throne of atlantis no was that it whatever the arc was with the giant tidal wave thing because they say oh i was caught in a tidal wave and the moon shifted oh no it would have been forever evil okay never mind anyway uh baltimore got flooded a bunch of stuff's boarded up and the vampires are like it's perfect there's a bunch of bodies lying around and we're able to hide out from the sunlight in here so stop complaining that you're a vampire and just eat and as they're doing so the wall blasts open and it's pandora and agent kincaid and they say stop you're under arrest and immediately the vampires start scattering pandora shoots a few of them one of them manages to jump out a window which giganta grabs and just pops the head off like a top of a dandelion just says like ah oh, yeah teamwork makes the dream work so one of the vampire turns into a mist pandora casts a spell that puts it back into a solid form and Kincaid's like oh you got to show me that and she's like it takes 16 years of straight meditation she's like all right never mind so they continue to keep on fighting the vampires but another one of them turns into mist uh and Pandora's like how in the hell did it escape my binding spell I have no idea so she goes running after that vampire tries to get a feel for it um she reaches out with her extra sensory powers and tries to feel the sin, but also like the human that was underneath, seeing if there is any hope for them at all. But ultimately, she just feels this tangle of lust and sloth and rage and all that sort of stuff. Just like, oh, OK, he turned into a mist and went down the pipes like there's no way I can get to him. So we got to move quickly if we're going to hope to deal with this. So Giganta meets up with Kincaid. Kincaid's on the phone basically calling him for backup, telling Shade, yeah, we got a whole nest in here. You're going to have to send in some containment crews. Like, I've got some people here, but they don't know what they're doing. And Giganta's like, um, excuse me. I thought I did a pretty good job of catching that vampire and popping a head off. She's like, yeah, 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 look, hey, I'm on your side. Let's not argue about this. So Pandora goes down to some storage areas where the, I guess, piping leads out to, when all of a sudden she's surprised from behind with a stake through the heart. And who is it but Mr. I Vampire himself, uh, Andrew Bennett? And he's like, die, monster. And she's like, wait, hold on, I'm not a vampire. She's like, very likely what a vampire would say. And so she pulls out her blades. He's got a sword to work with. And she's like, look, you got to listen to me. I'm not a vampire. Like, you staked me through the heart and I'm still moving. That's proof enough. And he's like, ah, you might have just moved your heart. I've seen weirder stuff. So 
she manages to get a blade to his throat and he's like all right fine i'll listen what are you if you aren't a vampire because you clearly aren't human and she's like oh you reach into your soul you'll know me and he's like oh, that voice pandora mother of monsters and he like bows down and she's like are you are you mocking me is that what's going on right now so Kincaid and Giganta walk and talk for a bit and she basically offers a job and just basically like look I can bring you on I can convince them to bring you on as a consultant you'll get a payday and like you're just going to be fighting monsters like this constantly and she's like oh would that uh clear my cl criminal record too I'm not gonna be a fugitive and she's like yeah probably I think I could swear all that away when all of a sudden they hear like a little scratching noise down the hall and they go to investigate it meanwhile Andrew and Pandora are also going to talk and Andrew explains yeah Look, I was dealing with the vampire stuff and it, it, I let one of them go because of personal reasons. But, you know, they didn't stop making more vampires and feeding and whatnot. So now we got this whole nest thing and I'm just trying to deal with it. And Pandora's like, yeah, all right. So then Andrew inter interrupts her and she's like, by the way, there are people like most people, vampires believe that our ancestors go back to Cain and Lilith. But there are some people who believe that Pandora used her blood to give birth to both of them. Is that true? And Pandora's like, of course I'd be blamed for making vampires. I've been blamed for everything else. What do you think, Andrew? And she, he's like, I don't really care. I mean, it's whatever to me. I just care about killing vampires. That's all I need to do. So they follow him to an elevator shaft. They crack it open. They jump inside. And as they look up, they see that there's this horrific looking spider web thing and pandora's like have you ever seen that before do vampires make spider webs and he's like nope not really but can you hear them up there some there's like a lot of them so we see that kincaid and giganta are at the top of the elevator shaft and they're hear something scratching at the door they get ready to attack and as the door opens up they're like immediately start getting swarmed uh, Pandora and Andrew fly their way up to the web to see what's going on there. They can sense that there are innocents inside the web. And Andrew's like, I'm surprised that you care at all about innocence. And she's like, yeah, okay, whatever. So they tear through the web as much as they can, but immediately the vampires start coming out and turns out that the monster that made this web is a giant spider monster that absorbs other like vampires and other beings it has like seven heads going on and a bunch of arms and it's like cocooning innocent people and it smells agent kincaid as a shapeshifter and just like oh that's delicious i haven't had one in so long so pandora and andrew fly up they start stabbing and shooting as best they can the different pieces of the vampire start just falling off of the body and as they're like cutting off heads destroying them uh andrew's saying like don't let any of them escape if one of them escapes that's a dozen dead people outside minimum so agent kincaid falls down uh the elevator shaft andrew's like hey uh your friend and she's like don't worry about her she'll be fine and of course she uses her bird wings to land uh Giganta's just punching through vampires left and right saying how satisfying it feels it's like punching through glass and as they all start misting out she's like oh yeah running away come on give me more of a fight so pandora gets all the innocents like cocoons out and andrew cuts them open says like all right they're unconscious maybe they were poisoned with something either way they'll be fine we'll, we'll get them help and andrew's like all right well a couple vampires escaped i gotta go deal with them real quick Agent Kincaid, good seeing you. Tell Shade nothing about this. I don't want to be known about. And then he just misses away. And Giganta's like, oh man, this is so awesome. I love this. It feels just being a good guy. feels like just being a bad guy. Like you can do all the same killing and stuff. And Kincaid sees that Pandora's upset by that notion. She's like, hey, don't listen to her. She's clearly like got some issues. But like, if you want to be a good guy, I trust you now. Do you want to join Shade and help us fight the good fight? Make an alliance. And Pandora says, you know what? doing some good i like that and that's where we end that is the final issue of pandora we do get a future zentai in that is how we officially end it but um yeah that's the end of it so for anybody who knows me anybody who's been following this show you know that i really like i vampire i i thought that was a very well written book i didn't get my fix of that in this issue they promised me i vampire and i got pandora number 14 so ultimately i'm a little bit disappointed there that's in my own personal thing i'll try not to hold it against the book all in all though this does definitely feel like a it it feels like they had a bigger plan going on 
and they realized how much of it they had to scrap once they were told that the book was canceled. Like Ray Fox had maybe another couple arcs and then all of a sudden he was like, nope, you get three issues. And then he just go, go, okay, I get Pandora back into whatever state I want her at. I think she might still be mortal at this point. So that's going on. And then we need just one issue of filler to get her onto the side of Shade. So she fights vampires. Why not? It doesn't feel very connected, but if that's how they wanted to do it, I'm not going to complain. I think it's an all right issue. Definitely nothing great. It's probably like 6.5. I can't give it higher than that. And honestly, I could be convinced down to a 6, but I th I think that is going to be my eye vampire talking rather than how much I actually enjoyed this book individually. So I'll keep it at a 6.5 and Pandora was a book and now it is done. Batman Eternal number 20, written by Snyder, Tanyan, Fox, Levin, and Seeley, art by Emmanuel Simeone. So this issue picks up in a uh, Brazilian forest, and we see that the Dr. Falsario, the guy that Batgirl thinks did mind control or whatever on Jim Gordon to make him see a gun, and to be fair, he did, uh, is running through the forest trying to escape Batgirl, and we see Batgirl just like, up in the trees being like, oh, there's nowhere you can run from me, Dr. Falsario. I've got you now. So back in Gotham, we see in the underground, a little girl named Jade is about to be sacrificed by the Ten-Eyed Man. Killer Croc and Batman are fighting against his weird cult thing going on. And as he's doing all the mystic mumbo jumbo and shouting up the skies, all of a sudden an interdimensional portal opens up and Jade starts being brought through and he's just like, oh, yes, accept my gift and give me the sight that I need to see how uh, all of this will go in Gotham. So uh, Batman uses his grappling hook gun to get a hold of Jade, manages to pull her down. And immediately Ten Eyed Man's just like, uh, bro, the portal's opened. It needs a sacrifice. He's like, it, it's going to make bad things if that doesn't happen. And then all of a sudden the portal does a big thracoom and the entirety of this cave system just starts collapsing down on it. So uh, Killer Croc tosses Jade over to Bard, who gets a hold of her, and then Croc and Batman have to jump over this chasm as Ten-Eyed Man is just shouting up crazy things of things to come. He's like, oh, the totem will be etched upon your flesh in blood and the, the watchful moon will go dark and all this horrible stuff. So let me go over to Blackgate where uh, we still have the prisoners holding uh, police officers hostage inside and they're calling to the outside basically saying, all right, here's the deal. We're part of Penguin's gang. We got cops. We want Falcone. You give us Falcone and the officers will be fine, but you have a limited amount of time. So we cut back into the high security room where Penguin and Falcone are being kept. And the warden there is like, okay, I'm getting a call from the outside. Let's see what all this is about. We're still waiting on Jim. And Harvey Bullock's on the other side saying, hey, they wanted to trade hostages for Falcone. And she says, well, we're waiting on Jim. And he's like, okay, then we'll wait on Jim. He's doing a diehard. Let's, let's let him do his diehard then. So as they talk about that, they say, wait a minute, hold on. Wasn't Leo around? What happened to Leo? And we see Leo has made his way back into his cell and he is shaving. And as he shaves off his beard, he's singing... Uh, the lion sleeps tonight and it's all this is interspersed with Jim doing a diehard I'll get back to it but ultimately he opens up a denture case and inside of it are some horrific looking fangs and like just sharp teeth in general and he's like oh you still got it Leo so Jim Gordon doing a diehard he activates the sprinklers when the guys are saying, all right, they've had enough time, kill a hostage. Uh, they throw in some, he throws in some liquid nitrogen that he got from downstairs, and he manages to use that to ice the floors, and then uses some uh, pedals from an exercise bike to get some grip as he goes in and starts beating up all the guys inside. So back to Brazil, Falsario is still walking through saying like, oh, I managed to lose her, but like, it's only a matter of time. There are three of them. Oh, the, these demons that have been sent for me. And as Batgirl hears him yelling out, she goes, finds Falsario, already dead. 
His knife, his throat has been slit by a knife that she finds in a tree. It's a very ornate looking knife. And she's like, no, I needed him alive to like confess to framing my dad. Who the hell did this? So back in the Gotham underground, all the caves are falling apart. Uh, they're having to leap through and like dive into rivers and stuff like that. And eventually they do manage to get to safety and Jade is okay. And Croc's like, all right, cool. We did it. I'm a bounce. Uh, thanks. And immediately Bard's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Killer Croc, you are under arrest, under suspicion for killing a bunch of police officers. So we cut back to Jim Gordon's Die Hard. Uh, one of the guys is Volt, and he has electricity powers, so he ends up using... Well, he doesn't have powers here, but he tases, because that's his whole shtick. Uh, Jim Gordon and manages to n knock him out. Or at least it seems like he's going to, because as he's coming in for a final like face stomp on Gordon, saying, hey, thanks for the hostages, you've given us a little bit extra here. Uh, all of a sudden, the guy is torn off of Gordon. Gordon sits up, bleary-eyed, looks around, and he sees his roommate Leo is no longer Leo. He is Rex Calabrese, the lion, which, no duh, you go by the name Leo, and then you say, oh, there was a crime boss named the Lion, and like, huh, I wonder if the two are connected. So he's just like, he's got like claws going on, he's got his fangs, he's just going for blood. Um, back in the underground, Bard's trying to arrest Croc, and he's like, I'm not gonna go with you, dude. Like, yeah, I killed those cops, they were dirty, they were awful, I'm not gonna regret that. So... Jade, go over to Batman because I'm going to have to go do some stuff now. And so Jade gets over to Batman's side and Bard's like, no, I'm I'm taking you in. This is my town. You're going to face justice. And he's just like, no, God himself cannot budge me. So Croc hits some of the supports down in this cave. Everything starts crumbling down and he manages to escape. But Batman and Bard get away with Jade. So back in the Blackgate area, we see that all the... Cops have been freed, everyone's safe because of Gordon's diehard antics, but then they he also goes over and talks to Leo, and he's like, hey man, you managed to live quietly here, no one even knew that you were Rex Calabrese, why did you give that all up, like now, like, you could have just kept that a secret for a lot longer, and he's like, my daughter grew up without her dad, one of those police officers that we mentioned before, he has a daughter. I didn't want her growing up without a dad. It seemed worthy enough of a thing. And like, I've done some bad stuff. I belong in here. But I think you understand that like, the, the that feeling of guilt of having to pay for your past uh, things. So we go over to Batgirl who comes back to the factory. All the kids are being freed. They're all being led to authorities in order to get them reunited with their families. And Batwoman's taking care of that. Uh, Batgirl comes over to Red Hood, who's in the corner, and he, she's like, Red Hood, it, I, I lost, he's dead. I, I don't know who did it, but I got this fancy looking knife. Like, what happened? Like, I can't free my dad now. And he's like, hey, that woman hacked into computers. We have plenty of evidence that he did it. Don't worry about it. You're, we're going to free your dad as soon as we get back home. And she's like, oh, thank God, Jason. Thank you so much. So we then see last shot of Gotham City. Jason Bard is taking Jade to a uh, paramedic to get her checked out and Batman calls Alfred and is like, you know, I think you might have been right about Bard. I think he might be worth being trusted. And he's like, that's great. My daughter went to a club and I'm just now finding out about this. So come back. I've got some hangover breakfast being made for her. And the final page we get here is uh, Stephanie Brown. She's still writing on her blog and she's like, look, I have used this blog in the past for a bunch of celebrity gossip and scandals and like leak nude posting. And now that something has come up that actually matters, all of you think I am still just spreading rumors and gossip and none of this is true and none of you are believing me. It's just schlock. Well, she goes on this whole thing about movie critics and spoiling and stuff like that. But lo and behold, she says, you know what? If no one else is going to take this seriously, then then I've got to get out there and I've got to, I've got to stop it myself. So spoiler alert. Here I am. And we see that she's put on the full spoiler outfit and she's ready to go. Okay. Solid issue all throughout. I like it. It wraps up all the plots nicely. Though it is weird that all of the plots get wrapped up nicely. Like we were building up each of these different things, the Batgirl stuff, all that things going on, and they each get wrapped up at issue 20, which makes it feel like by the time we hit the next issue, 
everything's just going to be like a fresh start. Everything's just going to be like a, okay, phase two of Batman Eternal begins now. So I'm curious to see what that's all going to entail. Um, we still, we haven't gotten a lot of Catwoman stuff recently. I think she's supposed to be like a mob boss by the end of all this. There's a bunch of stuff going on. I'm looking forward to it. But all in all, this issue, I think this issue just feels like, like a 7.5 to me. It's not quite in great territory, but it is definitely, it wraps them all up very satisfyingly, if not a little bit quick at times, while still leaving future mysteries ahead. So 7.5 for this, and we'll see what comes next. Future Zen number 16, written by Azarel, Lemire, Jurgens, and Giffen, art by Jesus Marino. So this issue picks up in Washington, D.C., where we see a little deal going down. Two people are handing off for an actual wad of cash, which apparently is super rare in an all-digital future. They're handing off a bunch of Earth cards, which are essentially ID cards, but they're genetically tied. So it takes a lot of effort to be able to fake these things. And long story short, they use DNA from Earth 2 people to frame Earth 1 people, whatever. Point being is that it took a lot of effort. And so this guy handing over the cash says, all right, well, that's all I needed to hear. And he takes off his hoodie. And it turns out that he is the hero Storm Guard, who's literally dressed in an American flag. And he starts beating these guys up. Uh, the one girl's just like, hey, I'm not going back to jail. And he's like, yes, you are. You, you're getting 20 years for fake ID cards. And as he's hitting her a few times, she says, hey, you've got the matter dispersal device. Use it. And the other guy pulls out this little device and says, back when during the war, I saw a device. This device was put onto an apocalyptic ship and it just vaporized it to nothing. And I'll put it on you, man. And immediately Stormguard's like, whoa, hey, now that's that's military tech. Did you serve in the military? Uh, I, I had good friends in the military. He's just like, do you know how hard it is to find work with PTSD? And literally Stormguard is just like, hey, man, look, you know I got to take you in. You've, you've broken the law. That's what happens here. But, like, the war hit all of us. You've, you've got to understand that. we Some of us lost everything. And there's these memorials and all that sort of stuff. But nobody knows what it was like fighting on the front lines like you and me. And he's like, oh, but what am I supposed to do? He's like, oh, well, I, I, I know what I was doing. I fought back and came back from the brink. You can do the same. And he puts his hand on this guy's shoulder and offers to help. But they're going to jail. So then we go to Cadmus Island, where Faraday is watching a replay of uh, Mr. Miracle, a.k.a. Scott Free's cell. And he zooms in and sees the detail of, like, the monitors that Scott's looking at say, Run, Scott, Run. To which I guess that's slipping in the facade, to which Faraday's like, Why would you drop it now? Or, like, did you even know you were dropping it? So we cut across the island. Lana... Lang from Earth 2 is being, or maybe Earth 1, I don't know. Uh, she's currently basically being held hostage by 50 Sue, but 50 Sue is treating her as a maternal figure to counteract Slade as the paternal figure. And it's just, just like shooting the shit and just talking all day. So they're talking about like, what would Faraday think if Lana's up there? And then La Faraday comes in just being like, what do you mean? What do I think? And he's basically saying, okay, look, are you guys still hunting stealth Max? And they say, not really. They're all over the place. Like, it's not worth checking out anymore. And he's like, what do you mean they're all over the place? You didn't think to tell me they were all over the place? And she's like, nah, didn't really come up in conversation. So Lana explains that, like, look, we thought that, you know, the nerves of what, and she explains her backstory of what they were doing down in the sub-level where those uh, stealth Max might have been there. Uh, they were thinking that, you know, there was some form of post-traumatic stress. Maybe they were seeing things down there. They didn't think anything about it being stealth Max. So 50 Sue says something about Lana and Slade getting married in order to make a stable family unit for her. And is, there's something like, yeah, look, we saw this stuff. It was maybe about a month ago, give or take. And Faraday's like, all right. This whole system was designed by me. This stuff snuck in. We're fully compromised because this stuff shouldn't exist at all. So I need you guys to figure out who's behind this and you're going to do it immediately. So roll out. And 50 Sue's like, yay, family bonding time. So we cut over to Terrific Tech. Mr. Terrific is talking to his guy about manufacturing the U-spheres. It's 
they're not going to have enough of the numbers. So he's like, well, go to China, tell them they're going to be part of the revolution and uh, they'll get on board. And Mr. Trific's talking to, I keep wanting to say Brother I, but it's becoming more increasingly obviously that like it's Brainiac to some extent. Uh, he's talking to the computer saying like, oh, it's, it's what's the problem? Are you feeling pressure, Michael? He's like, yeah, no, like I, I have this vision, but getting other people on board is always the hard part. It's putting it into like the physical world. That's always the hard part. And he's just like, oh, well, you know, if you explain it to them, you they'll do what you ask. But do you think they'll ever truly understand what you're saying? And he's just like, ah, I mean, I don't know. My mom, when I was a kid, I begged for a puppy or a kitty or a rabbit or something like that. And she ended up giving me an ant farm. And the computer's like, ah, that sounds very disappointing. And he's like, you'd think so, but no, because it like really structured how I see people nowadays. And he's like, no, yeah, I get it. The presence of a colony, that's fascinating he's like oh that's how you see us as humans and he's like yeah no pretty much but like i can't wait to come and visit you i can't wait to be there uh once i arrive because you know i'm coming from space so then we cut over to lois lane and she's just driving into a area that's being blocked off by the metropolis police and she flashes her thing saying like oh maggie sawyer wanted to see me and it's like okay well, we're gonna have to check that out and then the police get distracted by this other guy who's trying to jump the barricade so lois manages to get in and they're blocking it off because rampage is on a rampage and she's calling out for boyer and as uh lois is standing there she's about to get a girder straight to the face when superman comes in and smashes it and starts fighting against rampage and he's she's like hey look we can help you if you want but you got to stand down now because you're going to kill somebody if you don't and she refuses. She continues to fight Superman. Uh, she picks up a gun from one of the officers and just rams it straight into Superman's mask, which ends up shattering the glass in the front and exposing the bottom of Superman's face for the first time. And she just hits Superman halfway across the city, turns to Lois, and Lois is like, uh-oh. So then we go to the Stormwatch section, Amethyst, Frankenstein, and... Hawkman, Frankenstein just had the bad dream about the future. And he's like, no, you don't understand. Like, I don't dream. I haven't dreamed in 200 years. I have no idea why this is happening. And Amethyst points out like, well, Nth Metal does heal Hawkman. So maybe it does something to you as well, Frankenstein. I don't know. It's something with that. And Hawkman's just like, I don't care. None of this matters. We need to focus on getting out of this cell. And then the walls of the cell just immediately come down because Engineer, now controlled by Brainiac, steps forward. By the way, not revealed that it's Brainiac yet, but got the three dot thing going on. That's always Brainiac. So she steps in just being like, oh, don't worry. All your questions will be answered soon. Uh, the master system has performed upgrades on me. I am no longer Engineer as you knew her. And Hawkman's just like, no, I can't believe that. There must be some part of you in there. We can help you. And she's like, no, not really. That's That's not a thing anymore. So... Frankenstein steps up and says, like, we're here to bring Engineer back to Earth, so you can either come willingly or we're going to have to drag you. And Engineer just wraps him up in, like, metal coils and whatnot and says, like, all right, look, we're all going to Earth soon enough. Don't worry about that. And then she just fires a gun at Amethyst, and Amethyst is just winded because it was just, you know, her armor blocked it. But then Hawkman's like, oh, you know what? I believe you now. You're not Engineer. You're not Angela. And just like, yeah, that's what I said. Clearly I'm not. So... At that point, Frankenstein's like, oh, it's this place, isn't it? I can feel evil all around us. And Angela Engineer points out, like, no, there's no such thing as good or evil. It's completely just made up constructs. And by the way, this isn't even a planet. So you're wrong on that front as well. And then all of a sudden, the ground lowers down and we see the inside of the planet. It's all just one giant machine spacecraft. It's all just one big spaceship being used uh, by the master of puppets here. And he's just like immediately hawkman's like this is it this is what must have attacked stormwatch this is what got rid of us like all this power here it must have been it and engineer's just like no this this craft didn't attack stormwatch my master did and the master like is perfection we are all of him and we see that angela is joined by a bunch of drones and they all say we are brainiac oh my god what a reveal they're brainiac i never would have guessed I mean, here's the thing. If you're a first-time DC reader, it might be a shock. It might be something of like, oh, the three dots. I didn't know that was Brainiac. But like, for anybody who knows anything about DC, you see those three dots and you're like, okay, well, we know where that is. Um, beyond that, 
it's okay. It's an all right issue. It's not blowing me away with anything. I think that the um, the first bit with Stormguard was not bad, but it's weird. The fact that like we already saw Stormguard earlier on, but this is where we're getting the intro to him. This is where we're getting the part of like, hey, real quick, who the hell's that guy? And we get this thing of, you know, he's a veteran from the war with Earth 2 and all that stuff. And so be it. I'm a little bit lost on the stealth OMAC plot. Maybe that'll come back in some way that's more understandable, but frankly, I don't really care that much. Um, by far, the part that's most interesting to me right now out of these plots that we saw in this issue is going to be the uh, Superman Lois Lane one, because obviously Superman's hiding something, and now that his mask has been smashed open, I'm curious what it will be. So I'm going to give this one probably just a... I'll give it a 6.5. It's not quite all the way down at 6 yet, but it's definitely not up at 7. So 6.5 for this, and we'll pick up next week with whatever crazy-ass things happen next time. And that's it. That is all the comics that came out from DC Comics this August 20th, 2014. And as I said up front at the beginning of the episode, there is something I did want to put here at the end for the, like, I don't know, six of you that listened to this ending bit. Yeah, I can see your audience retention. I know how long you're here. I appreciate you, but the rest of them can go suck an egg. Anyway, the thing I wanted to say is next week's episode is the season finale. It has been three full years since I began this show, and we are starting season four. Now, what does that mean? Well, after next week, audio-wise, nothing's going to change. It's all going to be functionally identical. Visually, I'm going to be putting on a new shirt, and there's going to be a little bit of a color change on the palette of this video. So if you watch the video, that will also mean nothing to you. But it means a lot to me, because it means I'm making forward progress visually. Um, also, for anybody who's unaware, after next week is DC's yearly event thing where they pause everything and do a special thing, and that is the Future's End tie-ins, where we jump five years ahead into the future of every single book and see what the hell's going on with them. So that's all coming up. I will mention it again at the top of tomorrow, sorry, next week's episode. Jesus Christ, could you imagine if this show was daily? I'd have killed myself after a week. Anyway, all that said, let's talk about the comics coming out next week. Next week, we have a decent-sized list, 14 of them, and in no particular order, they are Catwoman, Harley Quinn, Batman slash Superman, Superman, Red Lanterns, Sinestro, Aquaman, The Flash, Secret Origins, All-Star Western, Star Spangled War Stories, Justice League Dark, and our two weeklies, Batman Eternal and Future's End. Not too much longer now until we get that third weekly. Start getting World's End up in here. I think that's going to be the end of next month, actually. So that'll be fun. Um, yeah, beyond that, not much really more I want to say. So if you have any thoughts on any of the comics I talked about this week, last week, any week at all, go ahead and hit us up in one of our social media platforms. That's right, social media. It's such a good thing. Uh, we have a Discord. We have a subreddit. We have a Patreon. All the links to those are in the description or on screen. So feel free to check those out. Otherwise, that's going to do it for me. Thank you very much for watching, listening, however you consume this podcast. Be sure to interact with this video and or audio feed positively. That means thumbs up, five stars telling me I'm cute. Any of those things will count. But uh, yeah, I will go ahead and see you next week. Always try to remember, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> <laughs>